We are back, citizens of the Empire. We are in Marwind after a very, very long hiatus. In our previous episode, we were confronted with just how difficult this game can be and how our character is still pretty low level. And then we made kind of an errand judgment about where our divine teleportation would take us. And it took us to Ghostgate, which is right next to Red Mountain and even more scary than where we previously were. So we now have to walk. Well, actually, I think we can teleport back using the recall spell. But off screen, I sold a bunch of items to lighten our load. And I think we just went and further explored the religious aspect of the ghost gate, touched all the shrines because we're very devout tribunal worshipers. And now we can get back into it. You can see in our bottom right, corner here all of the buffs that we got we got rim's grace lady's grace vivix mastery arcane concentration arlandor's intervention personality rock of lothris soul of sotha still Pelus indwelling we got so many resistances so many fortifications and that's just from hitting every shrine that's at ghost gate so if you are part of the tribunal temple we also uh, stole, or rather took, or liberated some of this extravagant clothes. Really great for holding big enchantments. I think I sold a bunch of my potion load and my ingredient load, and we just have the essentials. About as light as we can get with medium armor here. And we just purchased Oakish Boots in the last episode, I'm pretty sure. We still got our good amulets. But I have to remember what they are because it's been over three months since I played this game, probably. Paralyzed and Frost, then the Skeleton menu comes out. We got the Paralyzed Glass Jink Blade, which we will be keeping with us. Um, what are we trying to level up right now? Endurance of Personality and Willpower. Okay, well, Willpower is Destruction, Restoration. Let's get Spear up first. And Medium Armor up. And then we can finish it off with that willpower. Personality also. Illusion. Hmm. Come a long and dangerous way to this Citadel Tabiri. My name is Gavel Oman. Tell me if you're looking for someone in particular. Services, a specific place. House Redoran maintains the hospital with bed. The hostel. With beds, food, and sundries in the Tower of Dusk. Redoran also offers services here for retainers and kin. The temple has healers for, and other services in the Tower of Dawn. Hmm. Okay. Well, as I said, I think we sold everything that is prudent to sell. The rest is just the normal potion kit that you should have in a Elder Scrolls Let's Play. And, um, yeah, it's either that or the stuff that I want to keep <laughs> because I took uh, the fancy clothes. So we are going to take the fancy clothes and put them in our house or our stash area. I'm often concerned that I may live as if I'm playing an Elder Scrolls game where I just have a stash area. And hopefully we're going to walk our way back to our main quest which was a Taos Tovani quest I'm pretty sure I'm a boy in Arminger a member of a small military order of the tribunal temple exclusively dedicated to and answering to Lord Vivek not Alamexria we pattern ourselves on Lord Vivek's heroic spirit and of exploration and adventure and emulate his mastery of the varied arts of personal combat chivalric courtesy and subtle verse so poetry we serve the temple as champions and knights errant and are friendly rivals of the more solemn ordinators in our dedicated service to Lord Vivek and the temple. Yes, it is said that the Legion has no courtesy, wit, poetry, or honor. I will concede that you have wit and poetry if you can win a contest of riddles. Awesome. I want a contest of riddles. Coordinators of doctrine and ordination are militant scholars. 
oh, wow, just like me. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm not that militant. Don't use that in court against me. Okay. Um, go skate. Okay. Interesting that this is its own thing. I wonder if that'll come up later. Soul sickness. Madness is a sickness in the soul. Well, I don't know about that. It's a sickness in the brain. It comes from a lack of faith and a love of sin. All this talk of bad dreams and bad omen superstition. It's just a sign that people have abandoned the temple and fallen into greed and wickedness. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty religious response there. Let's see. Oh, we don't have anything. So we got a, a hefty amount of gold, which is nice. Well, we got more glass stuff. Oh, glass light armor. That's expensive, but it's really nice. I don't have my light armor set on right now, otherwise I might come here. But just so you know, that's where glass is. It's pricey, but you can get some glass at the ghost gate. It makes sense because you're, oh gosh, that's so, so nice. If we weren't using a uh, long spear, we could equip this shield. Wow. See, old games can look really good. <laughs> and that's pretty. How can I be of service to you out there, Dave? Oh wow. Glass staff. What do you want? It's a mixed unit tactics volume one. I'm not sure if we've ever read this one, but I think it's one of my favorite books if I remember correctly. It's also used in throughout all of the Marwind or all the Elder Scrolls series from now on. You'll see mixed unit tactics in Oblivion and Skyrim. All right. Mixed unit tactics in the Five Years War volume one by Codus Colonius. The legions could learn from the unconventional tactics used by the Khajiit in the Five Years War against Valenwood. I was stationed in the Sphinx Moth Legion Fort on the border near Dune and witnessed many of the northern skirmishes firsthand. The first, or the war, started with the so-called Slaughter of Torvald. The Khajiit claimed that the Bosmer invaded the city without provocation and killed over a thousand citizens before being driven off by the reinforcements from a nearby jungle tribe. The Bosmer claimed that the attack was in retaliation for Khajiit bandits who were attacking wood caravans headed for Valenwood. So, already we're seeing the complicated nature of how wars start. You see this right away in Herodotus's The Histories, that oftentimes people don't really know how a war starts. It's like, you know, um, every side has their own different version or opinion about how the war started and what its justifications are such that both sides have an interest in feeling justified for the conflict, that they're in the right, right? Um, people often, both sides think they're fighting for a righteous cause, which makes it more dangerous. Um, this, of course, is somewhat uh, not true in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where many of the people on the Russian side are very clear that they have no choice in the matter at least from Ukrainian propaganda, which we're exposed to in the West. I'm very interested what Russian propaganda is saying about this particular conflict. Um, just so you know, if you're watching this in other years previous, Russia has invaded Ukraine in, I believe, February um, of 2022. And uh, it's been not good for Russia and really not good for Ukraine, but Ukraine is... Uh, showing up a surprising resistance that has shocked the military uh, science community all over the world at just how well they're defending. Um, you know, the belief was that Russia would steamroll them and it would be over inside of like a week or, you know, two weeks at most. But it's lasted a very vibrant defense um, for like over three months. It's, it's really incredible. All right. Um... And there's lots and lots of reasons for that, and we could make a separate video about that. One of them is Russian corruption and the fact that Russia isn't as good as they were claiming. Okay, but let's move on. Um, 
So, right, bandit attacks is ambient crime that the Khajiits probably were doing, to be honest. Like, Khajiit bandits are just a criminal element that's one of the ways that tribal groups uh, get resources from more established, you know, supply train caravans is if it's lightly armored and you're a bandit, you attack it. But it's not to say that Marwin doesn't also have bandits or you know the empire also has bandits you know if you ever play any elder any other elder scrolls game every single country has bandits in this place like there's no place that doesn't have bandits on the road um okay in the spring it's still not a justification for slaughtering an entire you know tribe all right in the spring of the third era 396 the war moved closer to fort sphinx moth I was posted on the lookout and saw parts of the conflict. I later spoke with both Khajiit and Bosmer who fought in the battle, and it will serve as an excellent example of how the Khajiit use a mixture of ground and tree units to win the war. So this is the role of a foreign military observer, which we have lots of in the conflict for the Ukraine right now, and indeed in all of the world's conflicts, is one of the jobs that you can have is you go visit other people's wars for your country and you take notes. Um, America and Japan famously were doing that a lot with each other before World War II and, you know, influenced some of the tactics and doctrine that modern technology brings to the table. Um, there's no better crucible than real conflict to see whether your fancy toys of modern technology actually work when they're put to the test in the way that you think they're going to work. And also, you know, uh, of course, that has to be qualified by the fact that every single war is very unique and very different, and the environment plays a huge role in whether or not your thing works, as well as the various trainings of the different armies. But that's also something that you can take into account. For example, um, observing the French and English army is very informative for... America. Because they're perceived to be similar um, in terms of education and culture. Okay. The Khajiit began the fight in an unusual way by sending tree cutting teams of Kathy Rat and the fearsome Senchi Rat or Battle Cats into the outskirts of Ellenwood's forest. Right, so, if you know anything about wood elves, trees are super super sacred to them in fact they don't eat plants they're carnivores they're obligate carnivores as their cultural uh identity because they think that plants are so sacred that they have to eat meat and in fact they eat humans as well um, because they're seen as not as developed as elves or myrrh and so they eat men. There's myrrh and men. And myrrh refers to elves. Uh, Boz myrrh. Dun myrrh. Alt myrrh. Those are myrrh. Uh, like myrrh maids. So, yeah. Um, when preying on the cultural differences of a group of people to incite them to change their behavior, even if it's aggressive, if you... Um, What's it? Sun Tzu has a famous quote that's, uh, if your enemy is prone to anger, um, enrage him, because then you'll be able to know exactly what he's going to do, which is good for you. You know, you don't, in war, you can't really control everything that another person is going to do, whether it's offensive or defensive. But there are times when you want them to be offensive because it's foolish to do that. And if they have a hot temper, you know that you can always just get them to go forward and do that. Um, you can bait them, basically. So this is great um, because the Kathy rate or Senshi rate or Battle Cats or Kajidi, they don't care. They don't believe the same way about trees, that they're sacred. They're totally fine with cutting down the forest. They don't have a problem with that at all. So that's um, something that they can do that their enemies cannot, and recognizing a very clever advantage in based in cultural and religious beliefs. 
When word reached the Bosmer that the trees were being felled, allegedly a crime in the strange Bosmeri religion, <laughs> so we immediately can tell the bias of this uh, imperial soldier author, is he's not necessarily a sociologist, he's not a cultural anthropologist, he's not um, approaching this with the type of you know, non-judgmental education that modern, uh, modern humanities majors would be. A unit of archers were dispatched from larger, from larger conflicts in the south. Okay, so you're already pulling resources from other things to take pressure off of them by pissing off the Bosmeri in a way that you know would piss them off, um, which is a great tactic. So if you can control your enemy, that's what it's all about, is making your enemy move. Uh, in chess, this is called uh, moving your enemy's pieces for them, which is doing things that p force their hand positioning-wise, um, which is, again, the they say that battle and certainly fencing is a dance, and in a dance you... Or in this dance, you must never let your opponent lead. And so that's what they're doing, is they're provoking them, controlling their actions, um, using emotion, which necessarily clouds sound judgment. And also, it's religious and culturally significant to them so that their commanders who don't take this action would probably be demoted or lose respect with their um, underlings, you know, in some ways, they have to do this in order to maintain their position within their society. If they heard that trees were being cut down and they just did nothing, they wouldn't be a very good elven commander. All right. Hopefully that wasn't too tautological. I've been trying to eliminate repetition and, like, saying the same thing twice in my, um, <laughs> in my, uh, speech. I don't know if... I'll be successful in that. Maybe that's just how I talk. All right. But repetition can be useful for education and learning. P positioning things multiple ways uh, helps students who don't get it the first way have a second chance to get it and also reinforce the learning. So there's multiple, as with everything, there's many sides to the same uh, issue. Okie doke. So... A unit of archers were dispatched from larger conflicts in the south. The Bosmer were thus goaded into splitting their forces into smaller groups. So anytime you take a big force and you split it up into small forces, what you're doing is you're exposing their local flanks and enabling defeat in detail. You're making it easier to ambush um, groups when they're smaller and they can't uh, support each other as easily. The reason that human conflict likes the large groups is because your shoulders in phalanx warfare which is one of the earliest forms of ancient combat and conflict for bipedal humanoid creatures is that if you're in a big group at least you can count on one of your sides and hopefully three of your sides being safe so that you can focus on the enemy that's in front of you with your binocular vision which is the point of how standing upright and having two forward-facing eyes works. Um, if our biology was oriented differently, we might develop different tactics, but for at least the common purposes that we require here, um, that's what you want. So if you're on the edge of a formation, uh, you're exposed from behind you, potentially, and also at your side. And when you get smaller and smaller groups, right, the smallest group is one person, where three of his sides are exposed and you can only really guard your front. Two people at least have cover to each other's shoulders, so that has one of your sides protected. Four people um, have, you know, two sides protected at least. And if you're in the middle of a five-person group, you finally have all of your sides protected by friendlies. So you need at least five to make one person uh, safe on all of his flanks and free him up to do other things, basically. So that's why, you know, you often see groups of five as the smallest unit that you can really have outside of World War II's buddy system 
I think the modern uh, rifleman group for um, the Army of Marines is nine to seven, but it's really flexible. I think five is the smallest that they go down to, but they try to have seven. All right. Um, but yeah, of course, modern weaponry has meant that, uh, you know, your sight lines and flanking positions are completely different. But um, back in like hand to hand military combat, which is what we're talking about with arrows and magic being the highest form of technology, you'd you'd kind of still be relying on sword and shield tactics. Okie okay, doke. Um, the Bosma archers took up positions in the remaining trees whose branches were now 20 or more feet apart, allowing some light into the forest floor. The Bosmar bent the remaining trees with their magics into small fortifications from which to fire their bows. Interesting. Right, so taking some of the greatest advantage that trees have and basically knowing, baiting them into doing something that used to be a good idea, but now is not much less of a good idea. When the tree cutters arrived the next morning, a half dozen Khajiit fell to the Bosmer arrows in the first volley. After that, the Khajiit took large wooden shields from the backs of the sentry rat and made a crude shelter. Right, so their ambush did work. Um, they got about six. And that's a small price to pay for pulling entire units of archers from a more hotly contested flank. And, of course, they immediately have the counter to that, which is large wooden shields from the backs of Senshiret and made a crude shelter. The Khajiit, even the enormous Senshiret, were able to hide between this shelter and one of the larger trees. When it became apparent that the Khajiit would not leave their shelter, some Bosmer chose to descend and engage the Khajiit sword to claw. Okay, well, that's probably not good. If you have an advantage um, waiting is often, you know, this contest of nerves or will between two different groups. Um, in ancient combat, phalanx combat for the Alexandrian era, that was kind of the first conflict, or the first fighting is the fighting of wills and patience and determination and willpower, is both armies would deploy out on the field, and then they would wait to see who made the first move, and they would wait all day. And a lot of times they would just go back to their camp at night and then come out tomorrow and the next day be with the contest being of resources where it's like, I'm rich enough to stay here every single day throughout this entire season. Are you? And waiting is, you know, the whole point of siege warfare and castle warfare, which extends from, you know, modern fortification sieges, you could even argue from Troy in prehistory all the way up to, I mean, probably the 1700s, you could say. There were some lengthy sieges in the 1800s, um, but like 1700s star forts were notorious for having massive, massive sieges, which is, again, a contest of resources. It's, I don't know, I would have kept the advantage kept your range you have a huge overwhelming range advantage don't just choose to give it up when the bosmer were nearly upon the shelter one of the khajiit began playing on a native instrument of plucked metal bars this was a signal of come some kind and a small group of the man-like ohms and ohms rate emerged from the covered holes in the forest floor although outnumbered they were attacking from behind by surprise and won the ground quickly so again the element of surprise is a psychological advantage that you can have no matter what your number is. And it often um, overcomes numerical disadvantages. So in the Three Kingdoms, um, one of the first uh, tactics that's ever written of in that book, which is from the 1400 AD period in China, is Lu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zhang Fei using a bait and then ambush like this in order to win when they were um, when they had less people when they were outnumbered by their enemy against a yellow turban rebellion uh, force and this is 
particularly prominent because large groups of people tend to move in big groups and panic spreads very quickly in large groups, um, especially if they're undisciplined, although in this case I don't think that the elves are particularly undisciplined. Um, but if something is one way and your psychology gets set that you're going to do this dangerous action of you know, martial combat where you could die with this advantage that you feel safe in doing because you feel like you have this advantage and then suddenly that advantage disappears then you immediately are like, well, I shouldn't do this thing, right? I, you are attached to this idea, and now that idea is taken from you. And that causes people to run away. And in military stuff, that's what you want the most. You, The first victory is the victory of flight um, or giving up. So it's so much easier to kill someone when they're trying to run away because they've stopped trying to fight, which is the the whole point is to get someone to stop trying to fight stop engaging in the activity of fighting all right um the bosmer archers in the trees would have still won the battle were they not having troubles of their own a group of dagi and doggy rate two of the less common forms of khajiit who live in the trees of the tenemar forest jumped from one tree to another under magical cover of silence they took up positions in the higher branches that could not hold a bosmer's weight and when the signal came, they used their claws and either torches or spells of fire, accounts from the two survivors I spoke of the very on this point, to distract the archers while the battle on the ground took place. A few of the archers were able to flee, but most were killed. Apparently, the doggy and doggy rate have more magical ability than is widely believed if they were able to keep themselves magically silenced for so long. One of the surviving Bosmer told me that he saw a few ordinary cats among the doggy and even claimed that these ordinary cats are known as Alfik. And they were the spellcasters, but Bosmer were almost as unreliable as the Khajiit when it comes to the truth, and I cannot believe that a house cat can cast spells. Alright, so we're already seeing cultural, um, cultural prejudices coming in and blocking the input of uh, information I mean or at least the acceptance of the information you should just report like what good history is is trying to take yourself and your perspective out of the facts as much as possible and putting it into the interpretation more so like um, you can't write history without a voice without a perspective but you shouldn't judge that perspective that's being offered so if someone tells you that a small house cat is casting these spells, you could just say that. You don't have to offer your um, editorializing after the fact. Um, you know, I don't know. I, you could, I, I don't know, actually. This is a complicated thing because well, everything is complicated. <laughs> but um, your estimation of the reliability of sources in this case did not prevent him from writing them down, which is the valuable part to us as the reader. Um, but I don't know. If you do feel like something is a lie, I guess you could include it. But again, that's not as valuable as the information at hand. All right. At the end of the day, the Khajiit lost perhaps a half dozen fighters out of a force of no more than four dozen. So of 24 people, they lost about six, maybe 25%. While the Bosmer lost nearly an entire company of archers, the survivors were unable to report back before a second company of archers arrived, and this strategy was repeated again with similar results. Finally, a much larger force was sent, and the Bosmer won that battle with the help of the native animals of Valenwood. That third skirmish and the Kajiri response I will discuss in the second volume of this series. All right. So that is mixed unit tactics with whatever the modern interpretations that I have available to me are. Um, so we can sleep in this uh, bed if we want. There's another book that I wanted to write down. Why are you here? Thank you. Wow. Um, let's see. Where was I? Hmm, level 100 locked door over there. 
That's slightly training. suspicious. Athletics, block, long blade. Walk Interesting walk training offers. There was a book that I wanted to show on the stream that was um, a religious book on cult worship. May I help you, Outlander? I'm not sure where it is. Yeah, here it is. Okay, well, there's... I think we did uh, read this book, but and it's very, very dirty. It's about, like, sexuality in religion, which is pretty funny. Um, but let's talk about... Uh, cultural biases in cult worship of the empire. So to save on time, I'm just going to read the original text and then we'll go back and talk about what we've learned. All right. Reflections on cult worship in the empire from the correspondence of Cassius, Cassius Placia, imperial trader writing from the Vos trade house in Varnfeld district, province of Marwind. So, Vos, I think, is the more imperialized trade location. Actually, I'm sorry, we're gonna. Vos should be on the map. Evanhart, Telvanora, Molagmar. Okay, I thought it was here, but. It may not be. Or rather, we haven't... Uh... Oh, tell Vos. Yeah, Vos. Okay, so here it is. We found it. All right, so a trader. Kind of next to the Ashlands area, more isolated than certainly Ebonheart or Vivek, where the capital is. I have noted that the Heartlanders, like myself, and assimilated imperial citizens of other races tend to impersonal and formal relationships with their gods and spirits. So Heartlanders are mainland people, not the islanders of Vardenfell. Vardenfell is just one part of Marwind as a whole, which is the uh, Dunmer homeland. For us, cults are first and foremost social and economic organizations. We typically think of the eight divines in the most abstract terms as powerful but indifferent spirits to be propitated, yeah, propitated and to think and do not think of their relationships as personal. So this is something that we see a lot in Christianity, early Christianity, one of the advantages was that it was a personal relationship with their god and deity, which other cultures and other religions didn't really feature. So it's very attractive. Notable exceptions include minor charismatic subcults of Akatosh and Dabella. The imperial cult of Tiber Septim was also a significant charismatic subcult. Right, so immediately this person is a trader who's educated enough to write and certainly confident enough to think Oh, I'm, I'm immediately analyzing uh, line by line. Okay, I guess we'll do it that way. Um, that's the most natural for me anyway. Okay, so this is a trader. They're probably well off. They can probably, they need to be able to write and keep records for their job. But they probably didn't learn a bunch of um, either persuasive structure or like speech and debate training or have kind of the other forms of argumentative structure or argumentative training because they make an assertion and then they immediately undercut their assertion with notable exceptions, um, which are, you know, important to acknowledge as part of your uh, work, but you usually don't do it right after you say the thing. You usually say the thing and then prove it and then include in exceptions afterwards. The problem also with this work that I immediately picked up on is these exceptions are huge. 
they're not minor charismatic subcults. Like, Akatosh and Debella are major aspects of many, many of the cities that you see in uh, Oblivion and Skyrim. Like, the Imperial Cult of Tiber Septim is literally the entire point of um, Oblivion. And, you know, there is a, an acknowledgement that that cult has gone down in recent years, but, like, that's Akatosh, Tiber Septim, and Debella are a huge chunk of um, imperial religion. So you're like, you're saying, oh, we don't have personal relationships with our gods, except for 40% of our, you know, of our worshipers, <laughs> of our culture. Yeah, you know, that part. And you could still make that point. It's just that I would do that after proving the other things first. Um, and there's just not, as we see, there's there just seems to be weak support for the main point and lots and lots of support for the exceptions. Uh, certainly time-wise and space-wise, they're devoting almost half of their work to the exceptions. All right, with the exception of the Elysian Order, which Heartlanders regard as a dark age, religious cults have played only minor parts in the Heartlander and Imperial history. So already we see two exceptions right away. <laughs> And they're choosing one aspect of their history to just not include, to just say, oh, well, that's not a real history. You know, that's not a real culture. That was just a dark age within our culture. And that's a very classical modern or a classical historical fallacy to just say like, oh, uh, you know, Europe is a period of enlightenment, except for the dark age, which was 700 years. You know, don't worry about that. That's not really... Uh, European culture, right? It's the no true Scotsman fallacy is that no true Scotsman would, you know, like the thing that you're trying to criticize. It's again represents an incomplete understanding of their own culture and then using that incomplete understanding to judge other cultures, which is super common in Eurocentric uh, humanities. All right. So, uh, religious cults have played only minor parts in Heartlander and Imperial history, except for Oblivion, which is the next game. The Septim Emperors have made it a policy to limit the influence of cult authorities in aristocratic, military, and bureaucratic affairs. So this part would be fine. Now, if you want to say that, then you can make that your topic sentence and then provide a bunch of support for that um, instead of providing support for your, your counter-argument. Cult worship is regarded as a private and practical matter, and public pronouncements by religious figures are not welcomed. Nordic hero cults provide a strong countercurrent to the dominant secularism of the empire. So again, they can't help but kind of sub self-consciously or anxiously include support for the counter to their point, um, which is kind of a psychological phenomenon of... Um, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> All right. The Imperial Cult of Tiber Septim is just such a hero cult, and among the military provincial colonists and recently assimilated foreigners, the cult is particularly strong and personal. All right. So again, almost all of the space, all of the real estate in this uh, piece has been given to the exact opposite of what her point is trying to be. The Tribunal Temple in Marwind and its predecessor house ancestor cults are, by contrast with imperial cults, extremely intimate and personal. So again, a claim without support, um, which is fine for a topic sentence. It's just this whole paragraph should have just been support for uh, the claims that, you know, that the empire is secular and non-personal. We, we see some support but it's like it's just hearsay it's just she's saying public pronouncement religious figures are not welcomed it's like by who with what examples please include those examples in specifics um all right the imperial cult of type is just such a hero cult and among the military yeah okay 
the Tribune, Temple, and Marwind, and his predecessor, House Ancestor Cults, are, by contrast with Imperial Cults, extremely intimate and personal. In Ancestor Cults, the worshiper has a direct relationship with a blood family ancestor spirit, and the Temple Cultist's relationship with the Tribunal is a relationship with a living, breathing God who walks the earth, speaks in person with priests and cultists, and whose daily actions are prescribed models for the daily actions of their followers. So this is great. This part is very well supported. Good paragraph here. The differences in religious temperament between Heartlanders and Marwin Dumber accounts in large part for consistent political and social misunderstandings between the two cultures. Nice. Heartlanders do not consider cult affairs as serious matters, where the Dunmer consider cult affairs, and in particular, ancestral spirit veneration, to be very serious. Um, so this is pretty strong. Um, I like this structure, at least. You know, you're showing the two things. To be honest, that should be the entire paper. Um, they don't really go into exactly why uh, these things are happen. We know from other readings that uh, the worshiper has a direct relationship with the blood, family, ancestor, spirit. Uh, like, because it's literally their ancestor. Um, like, they, they know that person. They keep that person on the mantle. You know, their bones. Um, that would have been good to include in this paragraph as a more complete, um, really driving home the point about why those things happen. There's a good book that's called How to Lead, and it's Lead with Why, um, which is one of the most powerful questions that humans can have is how and why. And so a lot of my writing has tried to be about answering those two questions um, because I think that those are the most moving questions that are at the level that I'm working with. Uh, the question of what is often something that you kind of take care of in high school, which is like, what was the Civil War? You know, what was uh, the Revolutionary War? Once you get above that, and it's important, to, you need to answer those questions first in order to unlock the other questions. But when you do get past that, you need to go into how and you need to go into why, which are deeper questions. Um so yeah, and how and why is represented here with a bleeding God who walks the earth, speaks in person with priests and cults, cultists. That's why I think this is a strong paragraph is because it really focuses on how these things are coming about, which is more useful. All right. Serious matters indeed. Heartlanders are casual and tolerant in religious matters. Okay, so these are sweeping generalizations that fly directly in the face of the multiple exceptions that she included earlier. Uh, Dunmar are passionate and extremely intolerant. Again, kind of generalizations that are almost racist, certainly prejudiced. She's in Voss, so she would know that not all Dunmar, especially the Telvani that I'm working for, um, the House Telvani higher up in Telvoss, is very, very tolerant. But you could specify this as saying like Ashlander Dunmers or tribal Dunmers or traditional Dunmers are passionate and intolerant. Heartlanders do not speak with their gods and do not think of their actions as under constant review and judgment by their gods. Again, with the exceptions that we mentioned. And the Dunmer feel that at all they think and do is under the ever watchful eye of the tribunal and family ancestor spirits. Maybe because it is for them. Like that, it's not just that they think that, it's that they literally have a different relationship with their ancestor spirits because they're dark elves. Like, the paper doesn't go into why those things would come up. Um, uh, did I read that before? Okay. Let's go ahead and pull a save. Um, so yeah, very informative book. Um, one of the things I love the most about Morrowind is that they include their own biases. It feels like a very rich, lived-in world in the sense that you can read and see um, each of these things. Granted, they're done in like a obvious kind of ham-fisted, or not ham-fisted, but like a very obvious way, a very like painterly, vibrant way where it's like, this book is going to be ignorant. This book is going to be, you know, biased and when I read this when I was 14, it taught me about how to identify those things in text in the first place, um, which was very useful for, you know, high school level humanities and writing classes as well as college level. It's something you could still use today. 
And we'll just do this one just because it's fun. Uh, forgive me if we've read this in previous ones. Um, the 36th lesson of Vivek's Sermon 14. Vivek lay with Molag Ball for 80 days and ate through, though headless. In that time, the prince placed the warrior poet's feet back and filled them with the blood of Daedra. In this way, Vivek's giant form remained forever harmless to good earth, and the pomegranate banquet brought many spirits back from the dead so that the sons and daughters of the Union had much to eat besides fruit. The Duke of Scamps came while the banquet was still underway, and Molagbal looked on the seven penance with anger. The king of rape had become necessary and therefore troubled for the rest of time. His legions and Kuotas fell into open war, but the children of Molagbal and Vivek were too elaborate in power and form. I, I want some of this diction. We're too elaborate in power and form. I want to write sentences like that. The Duke of Scamps therefore became a lesser thing, as did all his own children. Molagbal said to them, You are the sons of liars, dogs, and wolf-headed women. They have been useless to summon ever since. The Holy One returned at last, Vec, the golden with, golden with wisdom. His head found its body and... His, his head found its body had been tenderly used. All right, so there's so many suggestive phrases in this. I'll just let the audience uh, figure that out. He mentioned this to Molik Ball, who told him that he should thank the barons of Move Like This, for I have yet to learn how to refine my rapture. My love is accidentally shaped like a spear. Wow. So Vivek who had a grain of Aum's mercy, set about to teach Molagbol in the ways of belly magic. Okay. They took their spears out and compared them. Vivek bit new words into the King of Rapes so that it might give more than ruin to the uninitiated. Wow. This has since become a forbidden ritual, though people still practice it in secret. So homosexuality, I believe, is the, the subject here. Here is why. The Velothi and demons... So the Velothi are the people that lived on Marwyn before the Dunmer came here. And demons and monsters that were watching all took out their own spears. Hot... There was much biting, and the earth became wet. Okay. And this was the last laugh of Molag Ball. Watch as the earth shall crack, heavy with so much power. That should have been forever unalike. Then that stretch of badlands that had been the site of the marriage fragmented and threw fire and a race that is no more, but that was terrible at the time to behold came forth, born of the biters. That is all they did, and they ran amuck among the lands of the Velothi, or the Veloth, and even to the shores of Red Mountain. But Vivek made of his spear a more terrible thing, from a secret he had bitten off from the King of Rape, and so he sent Malagbal tumbling into the crack of the biters and swore forever that he would not deem the king beautiful ever again. Aw, that's sad. Vec wept as he slew all those around him with his terrible new spear. He named it Muthara. Muathra. Which is milk taker. And even... Okay, milk. Yeah. I'm sure which milk they're talking about right here. And even the Chimeri mystics knew his fury. Anyone struck by Vivek at this time turned barren and withered into bone shapes. The path of bones became a sentence for how the, for the stars to read, and the heavens have never known children since. Vivek hunted down the biters one by one, and all their progeny, and he killed them all by means of the nine apertures, and the wise still hide theirs from Muthara. 
means of the nine apertures and the why still hide theirs. The ending of the words is on CV. Okay, so lots to take in there. <laughs> no no uh, pun intended. Um, so clearly homosexuality, male and male sexuality is uh, being talked about all over this text, as well as some explanation for demons that are here and no longer are here. Maybe a religious justification for homosexuality. Yeah. He killed the them, meaning the biters, by means of the nine apertures, and the wise still hide theirs. The wise still hide what? Hide their biters from Muthara? Like the demon prodigy? Hide the demon prodigy? <laughs> Is it like a summonable thing, like a demon? I'm not sure, but who says that reading religious texts is boring? Um, Okie doke. So yeah, um, I think that'll be it for this particular uh, episode. I might do one later today, but yeah, those were some of the books. And I will... See you guys later. Peace.